gunpowder, tanks and flying ships in Middle-earth? Yes, really. Tolkien wrote about all of them, though not all made it to the final cut. Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we dive deep into the lore of Tolkien's Legendarium, as well as looking at other great fantasy worlds like A Song of Ice and Fire and The Witcher. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. One of the criticisms that is sometimes levelled at fantasy worlds is that they never seem to advance technologically. Despite civilizations surviving for thousands of years, they remain stuck in a medieval era. This is particularly striking, perhaps, for Tolkien's world, for one of the key themes that emerges from his stories is that of the impact of technology and industrialization on people and the world. He even devotes a part of his introduction to the Lord of the Rings to bemoaning the impact of the Industrial Revolution on his beloved rural England. So you might expect there to be more evil industrial complexes apparent than there are. In short, industrialization is not very apparent in Middle-earth. Both sides of the war still use swords and shields, bows and arrows. The printing press seems non-existent, and the economies of elves, men and hobbits seem primarily agricultural rather than industrial. Which isn't to say that there aren't any signs of technological advance or industrialization. Gunpowder is at least hinted at. The fire of Orthanx Saruman's forces use at Helm's Deep seems very bomb-like, and Gandalf has his fireworks too and both Saruman and Sauron's subterranean manufacturing bases seem to be based on mass production, as well as rampant and seemingly unsustainable use of Middle-earth's resources. The deforestation is real, and something Tolkien obviously hated. We should also briefly mention the handful of items that are central to Tolkien's world that are magical, but also clearly created using craft and skill. The Feanorian lamps, the Palantiri, the Silmarils, and so on. Not technology, but existing in that hazy area where magic and technology can overlap. Bear with me on that point, because I'll come back to it. Because the biggest source of technology, with perhaps just a hint of magic to it, is Numenor. Human civilization at its height. We read in the Silmarillion that when the Numenorians started landing in Middle-earth... They now made settlements on the west shores, but these became rather strongholds and factories of lords seeking wealth, and the Numenorians became tax gatherers, carrying off over the sea ever more and more goods in their great ships. The Numenorians began the forging of arms and engines. And then a bit later, under Sauron's influence, we read that they multiplied their possessions and they devised engines, and they built ever greater ships, and they sailed now with power and armoury to Middle-earth. Metal ships with engines? There's more. When you dig into the History of Middle-earth books, you find Tolkien scribbling down that the teaching of Sauron has led to the invention of ships of metal that traverse the seas without sails, but which are hideous in the eyes of those who have not abandoned or forgotten Tol Erisea, to the building of grim fortresses and unlovely towers, and to missiles that pass with a noise like thunder to strike their targets many miles away. Missiles now? But wait, there's even more in the history of Middle-earth. It is said that those Numenorians of old were busy to contrive ships that should rise above the waters of the world and hold to the imagined seas, but they achieved only ships that would sail in the air of breath, and these ships, flying, came also to the lands of the New World and to the east of the Old World, and they reported that the world was round. Therefore, many abandoned the Valar and put them out of their legends, but men of Middle-earth looked up with fear and wonder, seeing the Numenorians that descended out of the sky, and they took these mariners of the air to be gods, and some of the Numenorians were content that this should be so. So now we have flying ships seemingly capable of circumnavigating the globe, as well as metal ships with missiles and factories, grim fortresses and unlovely towers. Did Tolkien really envisage a steampunk Middle-earth? Well, perhaps at one stage. But the truth is that not many of these more eye-opening technologies survived to the main published works. This is what Christopher Tolkien, who edited those collections, said about it. 
I believe that the story of the flying ships built by the exiled Numenorians, i.e. by the men of the land that would become Gondor in The Lord of the Rings, is the sole introduction of aerial craft in all my father's works. No hint is given of the means by which they rose and were propelled, and the passage did not survive into the later legend. So the flying ships at least seem to have been something Tolkien considered for a while, then left to one side as he developed his thinking further. But the other things, the metal ships, the factories, the engines, the forging of weapons, these all made the cut into the Silmarillion. It seems that as Numenor developed, its industry and craft developed from an already high base of what they had learned from the Noldor elves. We're told that some metals they found in Numenor, and as their cunning in mining and in smelting and smithying swiftly grew, things of iron and copper became common. Among the rites of the Edain were weaponsmiths, and they had, with the teaching of the Noldor, acquired great skill in the forging of swords, of axe blades, and of spearheads and knives. When they started to run out of resources on Numenor itself, they started invading mainland Middle-earth, taking metals from there, then using those metals to fuel even more expansion and invasion. When Sauron arrived in Numenor towards the end of the Second Age, he just supercharged all this. He was a master craftsman himself, and pushed them to more and greater metal ships to launch an attack on Valinor itself. All this is classic Tolkien. Technology is used for evil ends, to wage war, to attack the gods, and it's ugly. Indeed, Tolkien explicitly makes this link between technology, or the machine as he calls it, in a letter to his publisher Milton Walden, which appears in most editions as an introduction to the Silmarillion. He writes that, I dislike allegory, the conscious and intentional allegory, yet any attempt to explain the purport of myth or fairy tale must use allegorical language. And, of course, the more life a story has, the more readily it will be susceptible of allegorical interpretations. While the better a deliberate allegory is made, the more nearly will it be acceptable just as a story. Anyway, all this stuff is mainly concerned with fall, mortality, and the machine. With fall, inevitably, the sub-creator wishes to be the lord and god of his private creation. He will rebel against the laws of the creator, especially against mortality, and will lead to the desire for power, for making the will more quickly effective, and so to the machine, or magic. By the last, I intend all use of external plans or devices, apparatus, instead of developments of the inherent inner powers or talents, or even the use of these talents with the corrupted motive of dominating, bulldozing the real world, or coercing others' wills. The machine is our more obvious modern form, though more closely related to magic than is usually recognised. I quoted that extensively because I think it's important to understand. For Tolkien in this context, magic and the machine play the same role, in that they themselves are not intrinsically bad. We can all see that magic itself is not intrinsically bad in Tolkien's world. It is the will behind them that is, to rebel against nature and the creator. This plays out probably most clearly in early drafts of The Fall of Gondolin, one of the three great stories of the First Age. Morgoth, the great baddie of that and all ages, prepares to assault the secret city. We read that he assembled all his most cunning smiths and sorcerers, and of iron and flame they wrought a host of monsters, such as have only at that time been seen, and shall not again be till the great end. Some were all of iron, so cunningly linked that they might flow like slow rivers of metal, or coil themselves around and above all obstacles before them, and these were filled in their innermost depths with the grimmest of the orcs, with scimitars and spears. Others of bronze and copper were given hearts and spirits of blazing fire, and they blasted all that stood before them with the terror of their snorting, or trampled whatsoever escaped the ardour of their breath. Yet others were creatures of pure flame that writhed like ropes of molten metal, and they brought ruin to whatever fabric they came nigh, and iron and stone melted before them and became as water, and upon them rode balrogs in hundreds. 
Are these magical monsters or modern tanks? They are crafted by both cunning smiths and sorcerers, made of iron and creatures of pure flame, used to transport troops and yet writhing, snorting and tramping themselves. Magic or the machine? To Tolkien, it probably didn't matter. What matters is that Morgoth is using both to do evil and as an expression of his rebellion. And this, I think, is the heart of this issue. Yes, there were some steampunkish elements to the history of Middle-earth that largely vanished with the drowning of Numenor, and yes, there is more than a hint of the dreaded Industrial Revolution to the underground factories and technologies devised by Morgoth, Sauron and Saruman. But Tolkien never focuses on them. He never even really clarifies the extent to which these advances are magic or machine. That's not what's important to him. What's important to Tolkien is what that represents. Rebellion against Uru Iluvatar, and all that is right and good and settled about the world. Simply put, it was not good to sail an armada of dreadnoughts with torpedoes to attack Valinor. If you'd like to see more videos digging deep into Tolkien's Legendarium, there's a link appearing now on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the link to Patreon on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.